committee member for this symposium. I would like to introduce the people that will be talking. Our moderator is going to be Dr. Jeff Bauer, and uh, Dr. Bauer will be our keynote speaker this evening. He is a medical future, a futurist uh, and a medical econ economist who will provide a, a wonderful forum. And our panelists, who I will let Dr. Bauer introduce, but I'll just tell you who they are in order. We have Dr. Joe Merrick, we have Sheila Jenkins, we have Bobby Peterson, and we have Janet Muirhoff and Karen Wiest. And uh, I just want to welcome you, and we'll take care of housekeeping details later, other than to tell you, you have evaluations on your desk, on your tables, and if you would kindly fill those out between them in at the end, we would appreciate it. So let's get the show on the road. Okay, and what a show it is. I am really tickled to uh, see the, the attendance that's here. Uh, when I talk to the program organizers, uh, um, I don't think they envision this popularity, so it's exciting. And uh, before too long, we'll get you all involved in the discussion. But uh, this afternoon, we're going to take the morning's topic, and indeed probably the core theme of the entire symposium, uh, to primary care. How many of you were here for this morning's session? Okay, then I, I, they, you who just raised your hands, speak up and disagree with me if you don't think that one of the clear themes, one of the absolute conclusions of this morning's session is that, that we really need primary care. It is essential to solving our problems of cost and quality and access. And I think everybody felt that, that primary care, all of the contributions, if anybody felt the contrary, they kept it pretty much to themselves. Let's put it that way. And so primary care uh, is really essential to implementing the, uh, the promise of health reform, to overcoming its problems, whatever the case may be. So this afternoon's session is titled The Effects of Reform on Primary Care in Wisconsin. And we have five panelists who all have uh, pretty significant roles in primary care one way or the other. And this evening in my keynote, I'll also give a lot of credit to primary care as probably the most underused resource for doing what we could do to have a good healthcare system in the United States. That said, our first speaker is a real primary care practitioner, and um, one who um, is a general internal medicine specialist, um, immediate past chief of staff at Agnesian, and uh, eminently qualified in all possible domains to talk about how this really hits the day-to-day -day practice community right here in Fond du Lac in the county. So Dr. Joe Merrick uh, will be your first speaker, and um, because of the importance of, of what he's doing, we gave him the dispensation for using slides. Um, all, all in, but, but uh, um, he's got some pretty important numbers and thoughts to share with you. So, And, and all the others will all be 10 minute maximum presentation um, because of the core value of what he's doing. He has 15. <laughs> Dr. Merrick, and feel free to say a little more about yourself as you go along or as part of your own introduction. Okay. Well, I'd like to introduce the audience to the daily life of a primary care physician. And for the purposes of this discussion, that's going to include a general internist and family practitioner. I'm going to do this by um, presenting two common patient scenarios. And hopefully, by listening to these scenarios, I'd like to think about uh, several things. Number one, the challenges that face primary care physicians. The challenges to our overall medical system and the concepts that may have motivated some of the aspects of healthcare reform. The first scenario is Jim. He's a 59-year-old factory worker. He has chronic conditions, which is diabetes, latest type two, hypertension, high cholesterol. He smokes two packs of cigarettes per day. He weighs 280 pounds and he takes seven chronic medications. He was last seen by his interest in 2008. At that time, he was evaluated for his chronic conditions, and they were poorly controlled. He was advised on treatment and appropriate follow-up um, you know, recommendations. Subsequently, he had a habit of frequently missing, missing his appointments and canceling his appointments on short notice. He would call the office for a request of medication refills by phone, promising to make a follow-up visit. He would also request changes in his medications for pre-authorization and due to uh, insurance formulary. He would make frequent visits to the emergency department, mostly because of diabetic-related complications. Every time he'd go to the emergency department, he was advised to follow up with his primary care physician. The last contact with Jim was approximately one year ago after he missed an appointment. The hospital, a physician staff called the patient, reminding him of the missed appointment, and he responded that I slept through the last appointment. When asked if he would uh, reschedule, 
He became a little hostile on the phone and now says, I'll make an appointment when I something well please. He wasn't seen for approximately not, uh, a year until about in the fall of 2010. His internist was, was contacted by an emergency physician and since the internist last saw him, he underwent a divorce, he lost his job, he was able to get insurance due to pre-existing conditions, and he ran out of his medications. He was in the emergency department with gangrene of both legs and sepsis, which is an over, uh, overwhelming infection. He was admitted to the intensive care unit for several weeks, both legs were amputated, and he was discharged and currently living in, in a nursing home undergoing rehabilitation. The second patient scenario for, for illustration is Agnes. She's an 86-year-old female. She has hypertension, mild dementia, chronic kidney disease, high cholesterol. Okay. Uh, approximately 11 years ago, she had open heart uh, bypass surgery for several blocked arteries. At that time, she also quit smoking her, her packet of uh, daily habit. She was last seen by her internist in the fall of 2009, prior to going to Florida in winter. While in Florida, she experienced an abdominal pain. She consulted the gastroenterologist, underwent colonoscopy, upper endoscopy, abdominal CAT scan. All tests were negative. The pain continued, and she was advised to see her primary care physician. In March of 2010, prior to leaving Florida and returning to her home in the Midwest, she went to the emergency department for another illness. At that time, she was noted to have kidney failure, the family wanted everything done, and a nephrologist was once consulted, and she was placed on dialysis. After being discharged from that hospital, she was advised to see a nephrologist when she returns to her, her home in the Midwest, and also to see her primary care physician. Well, finally, um, when she returned to her home in the Midwest, she had another problem. She had chest pain, went to the emergency department, and was admitted. CAT scan of the chest showed small lung mass, which was sus suspicious for cancer. She underwent a cardiac catheterization because of the chest pain, and there was multivessel cord uh, coronary disease. They couldn't put a stent in place. The only reasonable way to, to correct this was surgery, but she was appropriately advised against surgery. She was discharged and again advised to see her primary care physician. Well, finally, she is here today to see her primary care physician. She's at the internist's office with her family and she presents with a laundry list of problems. She wants to know why she's tired all the, to all the time, weaker, not eating, continues to have pain, and is more confused. Her medication list has grown to 12 different medications. They have questions. Does she still need these medications? Could some be changed to generic? Is she taking them properly? They don't know the names of all the medications, but some are green, yellow, and purple. They insist that the medication list should still be in the computer, but that's not the reality. Some physicians did not enter the medications they prescribed, and most of the specialists were outside of the computerized system. Unfortunately, these are not uncommon situations in the practice of internal medicine, and thus make the job of the general internist challenging. The primary care physician is gaining increased recognition as a provider of indispensable and valuable services to our health care system. The primary care physician is vital in the management of chronic medical conditions, chronic medical uh, conditions identified to be a big burden on our society. The PCP is ideally positioned to aid in the coordination of patient care through a highly complex system participate in shared decision-making in which patients and physicians choose among clinically effective treatment options, utilize their knowledge of evidence-based medicine, comparative effective research to choose treatment options that are appropriate and judicious. They, should, they will also are, are positioned to provide leadership and direction in development, uh, development of novel methods of delivering medical services. This is such as the, the patient-centered medical home, and accountable care organizations. This brings us to another point and top, important topic in the healthcare debate, and that is rationing. David Leonhardt of the New York Times gave me a good quote, rationing is an inescapable part of economic life. It is the process of allocating scarce resources. The choice isn't between rationing and not rationing, it's between rationing well and rationing badly. Frankly, I don't know what David Leonhardt does for the New York Times, but I like the quote. 
And he's an economist. He's an economist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, rationing will continue to exist as it already does in our health system and other successful health systems around the world. For meaningful health care policy, we must make the distinct distinction and the choice. One option is medical rationing, in which decision makers determine which scarce medical resources are provided and who receives them, versus the more appropriate um, um, method, which means rational decision making, by which judicious choices are made among clinically effective alternatives. The American College of Physicians Ethic Manual notes that physicians have a responsibility to practice effective and efficient health care and to use health care resources responsibly. Parsimonious care that utilizes the most efficient means to effectively diagnose a condition and treat a patient respects the need to use resources wisely and to help ensure that resources are equitably available. Also, the Charter of Medical Profession Professionalism goes on to say that the provision of unnecessary service not only exposes patients to unavoidable harm and expense, but also diminishes the resources available for others. Patients should not demand and physicians should not provide medical services that are ineffective or harmful. Of course, there's always the controversial question, is, um, is health care a, is, is a privilege or a right? As you know, critics of the health care as, as, as a right camp will claim that if we make health care a right, this will result in overuse and inappropriate uses of resources. A disproportionate economic responsibilities on certain individuals and institutions, which will limit economic growth. Limitations of, of choice due to overly centralized structures and collective decision-making processes. Discouragement of the personal responsibility principle. Critics of healthcare as a privileged position claim that if we make healthcare a privilege, this will limit access and treatment to those who are economically or physically disadvantaged limit access and treatment to those with significant illnesses and in the most need, encourage racial and economic disparities in our society, and limit our nation's economic competitiveness due to a physically impaired workforce. And this is also not consistent with an advanced dem uh, dem democratic nation's concept of compassion and quality of life. To argue the extremes of these positions without recognitions of their criticisms is an irreconcilable and ineffective debate impairing the development of public health policy. Healthcare should not be debated as a privilege or a right, but a necessity. Conceiving healthcare as a necessity recognizes the legitimacy of the views advocated by both the right and privilege camps, but also, and more importantly, the legitimacy of the criticisms of both views. Without meaningful recognition of the criticisms, it would be impossible to craft a much needed healthcare policy. As we all know by this point, the United States healthcare system is experiencing unsustainable runaway costs. And these are been identified to be attributed to the following. A medical system has encouraged costly, acute, episodic, and procedurally based care. Failure to address runaway costs of overvalued procedures. Poorly coordinated care, especially managing uh, costly chronic conditions. Inappropriate use of resources, excessive duplication of services, excessive administration costs, and lack of meaningful tort reform due to a strong trial or attorney lobby. The ACA, American, or the uh, Patient Protection uh, Affordable Care Act, attempts to address this successfully in some, uh, but not all, completely successful. Unfortunately, our financial incentives are problematic. We pay doctors to do chemotherapy and surgery, but not to take the time to sort out when doing, this, doing so is unwise. Debate of health care uh, reform includes who pays for it, but more importantly, is what we pay for it. Also, there's a handout, and uh, in this handout, I supplied some definitions of terms and also some websites for frequently asked questions. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Merrick, for some excellent uh, and thought provoking ideas. Um, I would say you did that like a great general internist, and I say that as a compliment. I have a son who's a third year medical student. He has to uh, start making his uh, choices for uh, specialization right now, as you would probably remember. And uh, I hope he'll choose general internal medicine. I, I think it's uh, really neat, especially, and you saw the reality of those patients. That's everyday healthcare, and I'm sure many of you who are in the health professions at Marion understand that. Uh, um, that's, that's a challenging way to make a living, but a real rewarding one. 
um, because it's, it was such an incredible opportunity to do it. We'll come back to the issue of how health reform um, really uh, helps or hurts um, those interactions. But we also, in this morning's session, last night in Kevin's presentation, I spent a lot of time looking at the, uh, the health plan, the third party payer that's out there uh, passing the dollars between the employer and uh, the uh, providers for the most part, and a smaller part for people that just buy plans directly. And I'm happy to report we have a president of a health plan from here in Wisconsin, and that is Sheila Jenkins, who uh, runs Network Health Plan, and she will use her 10 minutes to talk about the topic from the perspective of the people that uh, make the dollars flow through the system. Maybe do just the opposite of what you just did, I guess. I had trouble with those all day. Hold it three seconds, they say. Okay. And red is good, I guess. I'm used to green, but. Uh... Is it on? Yes. I think so. <laughs> How loud do I have to yell? Uh, as uh, Jeff indicated, I am Sheila Jenkins, the president of Network Health Plan. I've been the president of Network now for about uh, eight years. Uh, so how many of you in the uh, audience are wanting to make a health plan executive your next career? Oh, no. I'm all alone? A one. All right. <laughs> I'll talk to you then. Uh, Network Health Plan is a local insurance carrier. We're located here in uh, Menasha, Wisconsin. We serve 123,000 members in the 17 counties surrounding Lake Winnebago. Uh, we offer group coverage to small and large employers and we are also uh, provide coverage to Medicare beneficiaries through our Medicare Advantage plan. So what we are not, we're not an individual, cover, individual carrier, so we don't offer any individual coverage and we are also not uh, in the Medicaid business. So our focus is commercial group and, uh, and Medicare. The, what um, John had asked me to talk about a little bit today was uh, health care reform and the impact uh, that I've seen and what we're projecting the impact on health insurance and health insurance uh, premiums and health insurance coverage. Uh, as Joe had uh, just alluded to, um, most, most everyone can agree that our current health care system is broken. Uh, since I've been president of Network Health Plan, uh, so that would have been since about 2003, we have never had a year where an average premium increase was less than 8%. So that is clearly unsustainable. Um, in, when health care reform started back in 2008, when there was a lot of discussion, uh, I think it was a great opportunity for us at that point in time because all of the constituents were ready to make change. Everyone realized that uh, the system just was not sustainable, whether that was the carriers, whether that was the providers, whether that was the employers, or whether that was uh, the citizens of the U.S. Uh, my opinion, um, I'm personally disappointed in what Congress came up with. Uh, not because they didn't have their heart in the right place, but they missed an opportunity to address both access and rising costs. And based on uh, my understanding of the legislation, most of the focus is on expanding the access with minimal uh, substantive work on reducing health care costs. There's still a lot of uncertainty, though, out there on how PPAC or health care reform will unfold. Uh, as you're all aware, there's a lot of legal challenges uh, going on, particularly with the individual mandate. There is uh, uh, individuals that would like to repeal all or a portion of the reform. And with any law, the devil's in the detail in that it's very difficult to react in many cases to many of the provisions in the law until the actual regulations are written. And HHS, or Health and Human Services, has a lot of discretion in how to achieve the goals of the law and how to develop those regulations. And unfortunately, many of the regulations come out after the effective date 
which does impede uh, all parties' uh, ability to implement them in, a, in an effective way. Uh, also within the states, I'm sure many of you have heard about uh, state exchanges and a new way to purchase health care starting in 2014. Each individual state has a lot of leeway in how they will implement uh, those exchanges. So how do I believe the healthcare industry will be impacted? Uh, based on what we know today uh, and what we're experiencing within Network Health Plan, first and foremost, immediately our administrative costs went up, which in many cases is exactly not what the government wanted to have happen, but when you add additional regulations, it means you need to spend the time to comply with the regulations, you need to fill out the forms, and the reports that go with the regulations. Uh, you need to deal with the auditors, the federal auditors, who come in and audit your compliance uh, with the regulations. And you need to deal with just the cost of implementing. So we've seen our costs go up with our compliance team. We've seen our costs go up in IT, in actuarial, because a lot of what we do has to now be certified uh, by actuaries, and in the finance staff. So. I believe that that's something that all carriers are seeing. Personally, I believe the industry is going to start to see some consolidation. Uh, and the reason I believe we're going to see more consolidation in the industry is that under the regulation, uh, carriers can only devote a certain amount of cost to administrative costs. That is limited. With the upward pressure on administrative costs as a percent of premium, in order to be able to spread that cost to hit the uh, required ratios, you need to have a critical mass of insured members. And so for some of the smaller plans, it's going to be very difficult for them uh, to remain in business. So I do expect there to be consolidation uh, over the next few years. We also expect premiums to grow faster than they would have without uh, the regulation. Uh, reasons for that, one is obviously the increase in the administrative costs. Probably the biggest piece is the subsidies. Um, the subsidies for, to allow individuals who can, who can let me rephrase that. The subsidies built into the legislation that allows individuals who currently cannot afford or who cannot get insurance to be able to afford insurance those subsidies are predominantly paid for by additional uh, taxes or fees levied on the insurers, levied on DME, distributors and manufacturers, and pharmaceutical companies. As with any company, if your costs go up, in order for you to achieve your financial objectives, uh, you pass that along to the purchasers of your products. So these subsidies, will, at least many of them, will find their ways back uh, into the premiums. Also within the legislation, there's, uh, well, I don't think it's been formalized, uh, there is uh, projected a slowdown in the reimbursement to providers, to hospitals and physicians. When hospitals and physicians receive less than what they need from government programs, they push that additional cost onto the commercial market. And so that also puts an upward pressure uh, on premiums. I'm not quite as convinced about what I'm going to say next, but there's a reasonable chance that there will be more people in the insurance market uh, subsidies should allow more individuals the ability to purchase insurance. There's the individual mandate that is encouraging individuals to purchase insurance. And there is um, penalties for employers that do not provide insurance. Uh, the only reason I'm, I'm hesitant to say that that's absolutely what's going to happen is the upward pressure in the premiums, will that uh, will premiums get to the point where employers will choose to pay the penalties uh, versus purchase insurance? Will individuals choose to pay the individual mandate penalty uh, versus purchasing insurance, particularly given the guarantee issue? 
We do expect the number of group policies, particularly small group policies, to decline. Uh, and that more has to do with the uh, availability of subsidies uh, to low-income individuals, the size of the employer penalty for not providing insurance, so that it may become more financially beneficial for employers and certain of their employees to, for the employer to pay the penalty, to provide additional compensation to the employee, and then let the employee utilize the subsidy and purchase health insurance uh, through the exchange on a subsidized basis. Uh, and so there is a lot of belief uh, in the industry that we will start to see a decline in uh, employer-provided insurance, particularly for smaller employers. Uh, we also believe that um, because of the upward pressure in premium, that smaller and smaller employers may choose to self-fund. Uh, because there they can actually, their premium would actually be more reflective of their group's experience uh, versus uh, the insured pool, which will be a community rated pool where all employers will pay roughly the same premium for the same benefit. And so if you happen to be an employer who has been very focused on wellness, whose employees happen to be healthier uh, than the norm, it may be more beneficial for you to uh, go on to the um, self-funded uh, market. Uh, we do sense that, uh, well, one other comment I wanted to make. There are a couple positive things, so I'll, I'll get to that here in just a second. Uh, the other that has actually started to occur uh, within uh, the federal reform under Medicare Advantage plans, uh, the amount of funding that Medicare was providing to the carriers for benefits uh, was reduced going into 2011 and will reduce over the next six years. Those reductions will cause reductions in uh, member benefits and then also increases in member premiums. So there is an impact on those individuals who purchase their Medicare insurance through Medicare Advantage plans. The couple positives, um, as I mentioned earlier, there hasn't been a lot of emphasis in PPAC on reducing costs directly, but there has indirectly. And I've seen a significant movement in the carrier market and in providers' willingness to look at moving away from paying providers for each service provided to starting to pay providers for outcomes to divert more funding to primary care to providing primary care physicians with the money they need through carriers for care management, for better coordination of care, and less uh, emphasis on direct procedural uh, care. Another positive is the uh, promotion of electronic health records. This is something that's extremely important and something that uh, the state of Wisconsin is working through uh, through creating a health insurance ex or health information exchange. We're several years away from that, but uh, the grant funding and the movement toward sharing health information across uh, the various providers and carriers is, uh, is also a positive. Thank you very much. You've reinforced several of the themes that uh, uh, keep cropping up as we talk about reform. So thank you. Very helpful to get it yeah. from the payer's perspective. Whoops. Oh, okay. I intend to nod. Technologically challenged. All right. What happened to my mic? You can turn the system off so the mic don't work. Oh, okay. All right. I can just talk louder, too, but we're going to need their mics, I'll bet. Yeah. Uh oh. Guru returns. Tell me we're testing one, two, three. That's why I can do it. It'll take a few seconds to reboot. Ah, get down to the When it works, it's the electronic health card. That's right. Okay. There you go. All right. Uh, yes, I hear the slight reverberation. Um, that, just heard some very useful comments uh, from some of the responsible for making 
ensure that roughly 84% of the American population does have insurance. As you all know, Wisconsin and other states have a lot of people who don't. And so we have a really very dedicated cadre of people uh, out of the social welfare domain, really doing everything to help people get the best benefits that they can, to compensate, um, get aid when they don't have it. And uh, we have a good organization here um, called uh, ABC for Health, and it is headed by Bobby Peterson, who will have the next 10 minutes to share that perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm Bobby Peterson, and uh, I'm a public interest attorney, and I run a nonprofit public interest law firm. How many people here have dreamed of being a nonprofit lawyer and running a public interest law firm? <laughs> okay, so I beat Sheila. I beat Sheila. So, all right, I thought so. Um, ABC for Health. Uh, I started it back in 1994 with a rather simple idea that I would be working with uh, people, families, individuals in Wisconsin, helping them navigate the healthcare system, teaching, training, uh, and using the law as a tool to help people get the services that they were supposed to be getting. This was all informed by my work as a law student at the University of Wisconsin Law School where I did an internship for a different public interest uh, uh, law organization called the Center for Public Representation and I was deployed to northern Wisconsin to work on uh, health care needs of the rural uninsured. As I sat down and interviewed people and talked with them, these were people that were being sued for medical debt or had gone through bankruptcy, basically, you know, had gone through a train wreck of, of problems, either health problems and debt problems. You start putting the pieces together, we identified that there were some options for these folks. There were programs that might have been able to help. There were opportunities to challenge that denial of health insurance. And it spawned the idea for creating ABC for Health at some point and using my legal skills as a way to really help people use the law as a tool to make sure that they were getting their Medicaid, they were getting their insurance, they were getting Badger care when they needed it, to help them get the services that uh, they should have been getting. Uh, our our health care delivery system um, is complicated. The health care funding system is even more complicated. There are many silos that are out there of benefits and coverage, many different programs, many different features of programs. ABC for Health works to try to help to de demystify that to a certain point, uh, but also make sure that people are getting the services that they need uh, and deserve. We work a lot with public programs like Badger Care, Medicaid. We also work with private health insurance, private health plans, uh, self-funded uh, ERISA plans, insured ERISA plans. It goes on and on. And all these programs have different rules and regulations. And if they're not followed correctly, it may mean that your medical bills aren't getting paid and that you're being asked to pay for some of them. Um, today, I want to come from a perspective of, uh, of a public interest attorney working with primarily low-income people um, in Wisconsin and some of the, the, the threats and opportunities, I think, that are faced with health care reform and some of the changes here in Wisconsin. Um, in our state, there are 1.2 million people that are currently covered by the Badger Care and Medicaid program. It's a, it's a tremendous expansion from even a decade ago. But about one in five people in our state are covered by these important programs. Uh, they have coverage. Uh, it's important to note that uh, there are problems with Medicaid, with Badger Care, uh, in terms of the reimbursement rate. But the programs offer pretty good coverage. Access to certain services is challenging, dental, uh, mental health, other services is challenging in parts of the state. Uh, but the coverage is, 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 pretty, is pretty strong um, if we could only um, get more providers, dental providers in particular, to participate in the program. One of the things that we need to be very concerned about is if we start reshuffling the deck and changing program eligib eligibility rules, if we start changing coverage, if we start uh, eliminating certain aspects of coverage, what happens uh, to some of those folks? Right now, we know that current proposals are to, uh, to look at the Medicaid program, to simplify the Medicaid program, make it more efficient, potentially eliminate certain coverages, to seek a waiver uh, from the Obama administration. A waiver that's being sought by the Walker administration is an opportunity to give them more flexibility uh, with the program um, and it sounds like a good idea, 
Um, it, it's something that I think we need to carefully look at to understand whether or not how those good ideas might be executed and what does it mean for people in terms of their coverage. One of the issues that, that we'll be looking at is the Walker administration has said, if we don't get the waiver from the Obama administration, by July 1st, 2012, between 50, 60, 70,000 people will be terminated from the program. That's pretty severe. That's pretty severe. Um, and there, there's a, a big debate going on in Madison and even across the country, across Wisconsin, in terms of what's going to happen to Medicaid. What provisions are in the budget repair and budget bill that are going to have an impact on people's eligibility and coverage. I've sat down with the administration uh, to talk about a few of these issues, and one of the one of the ideas floated is that um, there's uh, the state can save 25 million dollars, uh, and, and their goal is to save 500 million over the biennium of the two-year state budget to save 500 million dollars. And one of the ideas that they have is if they look at the termination notices that are sent out, and sometimes people fall off of eligibility for Medicaid or Badger care. They have a right to appeal, but they have a 10-day period in which to notify the state if they want to appeal. If they terminate that notice on the 10th day, the state could save $25 million. Now, that sounds like a good idea. They're going to save $25 million of taxpayer money. If you dig a little deeper, and I think it echoes some of the comments here, where does that $25 million come from? Where does that $25 million come from? So those are bills that aren't paid. Um, you know, people talk a lot about they, they're concerned they don't want socialized medicine. Well, do you want socialized debt? Because that's what it is. It's taking the debts of people that currently can't pay their medical bills, are going through bankruptcy, and spreading it out to everybody else. When we have a system of health care coverage in this country that has big gaps in coverage, places where people can't get care uh, or, or, or get care through the emergency room instead of primary care, it results in large bills, a lot of times that are, are absorbed by hospitals, health care providers and others, but they're shifted as was discussed here. It's shifted into everybody else's bill. And really what we're, what's happening there is that debt is being socialized to everybody else. So we're paying more. We see rapid increases in the cost of health care, but we could see further increases in health care if people lose a source of health care coverage. If people lose their access to the Badger Care program or lose their access to the Medicaid program. So I think it's something to, to, to uh, take a look at very carefully. Now when I talked to the administration, um, I also pointed out that it would be saving Wisconsin 25 million dollars. When we look at the Medicaid program and Badger Care program, that's state money. But these programs are run as a partnership with the federal government. So at least another 30 million maybe more depending on the timing of it and, and whether it's Badger Care or, or Medicaid dollars, uh, another 30 million of federal dollars isn't coming in. So we're not socializing the debt of 25 million to everybody. We're also losing the, the federal money that was supporting the program as well. So it becomes you know, over uh, 50, 55 million dollars that suddenly is added to all of our bills uh, in some ways because um, we're the ones that, that have a payment source. So it's something that concerns me quite a bit. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, you look at it as cost savings, but is it real? You know, and it goes back to um, a lot of my experiences in trying and working hard to fill in the gaps for people, to identify coverage programs, to make sure that they have coverage, securing coverage, access to primary care, access to services, you know, the Badger Care Basic program was just frozen in the last uh, week by the Walker administration. It was unsustainable, and there's, people aren't allowed to get into the program anymore because, for fiscal reasons, there's a $130 a month premium that was being charged, but now no one else can get in the program. Where are they going to get their care? Probably in the emergency room. Some of the examples that were cited here, and some of these people may have care, they're not, they're not using their care properly, but we're going to see increased emergency room utilization, uh, and again, those costs will be socialized to all of us. I think that um, when we look at uh, uh, the, the changing dynamic of healthcare and healthcare reform, 
Um, I'm concerned about some of the aspects of, of reform in Wisconsin that are looking at the private insurance marketplace too. People complain a lot about insurance mandates. You know, and some companies self-fund because they don't have to use Wisconsin mandates. They don't have to apply Wisconsin mandates. These are issues and things that have been, have been vetted by the legislature. Um, one of the, the mandates is uh, services for children with autism. Um, some of this, the, the, the new mandates are cochlear implants for children that have hearing impairments. Others are you know, maternity care, uh, home health nursing care, um, care for kids with disabilities. Um, and, and so some of these mandates are kind of important uh, but there's a movement now to say in Wisconsin we're going to eliminate the mandates and, and it's a new bill that's being proposed to eliminate the mandates and allow out-of-state insurers to come in and sell products in Wisconsin that don't apply Wisconsin mandates. That's a proposal. Why I think this is a bad idea uh, and I think this whole idea of um, sometimes consumer-driven health care really to me flies in the face of the idea of insurance. So if you go out and buy your insurance and you get to pick off your a la carte menu of insurance that you want and you say, well, I'm not going to need a lung transplant and I don't need a heart transplant and I'm not going to get diabetes, you know, that's not in my family and I just want basic primary care. When you do have a, a, a significant health incident, when you do need a transplant, when you do have high medical expenses, but it's not on the menu of options you picked, what's going to happen? Well, you might spiral down the path to medical bankruptcy, and that debt, again, is going to be spread to everybody else. So it's a, it's a choice we have to make. It's a, it's a choice we have to make. And I don't think it's between socialized medicine and socialized debt, because I don't believe that health care reform in its current incarnation is, is socialized medicine. I really believe, at least in Wisconsin, I think that when I look at it, I see programs like Badger Care as the right kind of partnership a public-private partnership between the state of Wisconsin, health plans, and the people of Wisconsin to make sure that we can get people in a pool of insurance that helps to absorb some of the risk and provide an opportunity to pe to, for people to get the care and coverage and services that they need and deserve. So, um, you know, I guess my point today is is uh, is is be watchful, uh, be careful in terms of thinking about cost savings in healthcare. Think about programs that knock people away from primary care and turn them into emergency room care. What happens to those expenses and how is that affecting the cost of your health care? And what's the smart way for us to, to deliver care, to make sure that everybody has a point of coverage? To think about pooling and, and sharing risk instead of what I call risk puddles and, and, and individualized, you know, uh, health savings accounts, I think, sometimes can be called a, a risk puddle. It's segregating care, it's segregating the healthy and the wealthy sometimes from the poor and the sick. And, and this is coming from, uh, you know, 20 plus years of experience of working in the trenches as a public interest lawyer and representing people. So I have grave concerns about that dichotomy. Uh, and I'm glad I had an opportunity to share those with you today. Thank you very much. Just quickly, how many of you are not in the health professions, but in economics or political science or philosophy, uh, um, ethics? How many, how many of you? Okay, good. Glad to see a few show of hands. Um, great food for thought there. In other words, I realize that uh, there's some super health professions programs here, but uh, you heard the issues that are really at the interface between the health professions and the people that uh, design the systems. And so thank you, Bobby, for the very good uh, intermediation between someone that provides private sector insurance and someone that does it through employers. So our last um, presenter is actually a duet, um, uh, Janet uh, Nierhoff and uh, Karen Wiest, who are uh, respectively the benefits manager and the director of human resources for the uh, Michaels, corporate guy, uh, Michaels and Michelle, down in Brownsville. And so uh, they bring the perspective of uh, an employer of roughly 4,000 people, I believe, and um, both union and non-union. Uh, another uh, little nuance is very important in figuring out how health reform is going to help or get in the way. So I'm not, I'm not sure who's first. Well, I think I'm going to start. Um, okay. I think I was going to do this, but I guess I'll hold up here closer. Um, my name is Janet Nierhoff. I'm the benefits uh, manager at Michaels Corporation. I've been there for 12 years. And 
I'm Karen Wiest, and I'm the Director of Human Resources, and I've been there for 11 years. So combined, we have 23 years of trying to offer some solid benefits to our employees over at Michaels Corporation. Michaels is a national utility contractor. Um, we're based in Brownsville, Wisconsin. We've got a couple hundred people that are based out of that location, but many of our people live and work all over the country. And we insure them under many different umbrellas, um, whether it's from a local network perspective here in Wisconsin or on a national network throughout the country. Um, right now on our insurance plan, um, we have a union group that insures through uh, union coverages, whether it's the operating engineers or if it's through the operators or laborers, uh, many different union groups. That is a separate plan that we're not going to talk really much about today, but it is part of the economic piece as far as Michaels Corporation is concerned. We also self-insure through Michaels Corporation about 700 people. And I think of healthcare reform, uh, Michaels, uh, as I've been there for 12 years, um, 10 years ago, Michaels started healthcare reform, long before many of the national uh, uh, players got involved, shall we say, the government and many of those entities, because it's a good business decision. We, as a business, um, we're in business to make money, and we're trying to control our costs. Now, as we try and control our costs, we think about how we spend our money. But as part of Michael's goal and part of our core values at Michael's Corporation, we have a core value that we're going to take care of our employees. And part of that is taking care of their health care. Michael started health care reform about 10 years ago when I started in the benefits department. And we've been offering wellness benefits for as long as I've been there. So we would encourage our employees to go seek medical treatment when they need it. We had low co-pays for doctor's visits. We didn't have referrals. We put in a lot of design, plan design changes to encourage our employees to seek the appropriate medical care. Now, you can try and incent those folks, and we've tried that, um, to try and encourage them to move in that direction through wellness benefits, again, through the low co-pays and low deductibles. Um, again, we wanted them to see the doctors because we know it's the right thing to do. If they're healthy and they can come to work, we're going to be successful as a team. Within the last couple of years, we've really talked a lot about our health care costs with our employees. We're self-insured, so that means that Michaels picks up the bulk of the claims that come through to the organization. We pay an administrative fee to a provider, such as Sheila's company here, to take care of our claims, and then we pay the claims as they come through. That's Michaels' money. So we encourage our employees to become involved in that process. Um, as you know, they talked about some of the numbers, some of the increases over the past couple of years. I think Sheila said about 8% has been the minimum over the last X number of years for their cost increases. So imagine the employer picking up an additional 8%. So what we've tried to do is encourage our employees to take some involvement, not just in their own wellness, but to think about how they're spending the money and to wisely use the plan. So when they think about um, I got a call this morning from one of the gals. She said, Janet, I need to go see an orthopedic. Do I need a referral? Gee, if I'm going to spend Michael's money wisely, not that I don't want them to see their primary care physician, but she'd already discussed this with her primary care physician. He said, ask, do you need a referral to the orthopedic? Well, no. Go right to the orthopedic. We don't need to incur any additional costs to the plan. So the employee gets involved in the cost, and already we've done that in Michael's, like I said. One of the things that impacted Michaels Corporation with the change to um, health care reform is that this past year we no longer are a grandfather plan. And if you read about the plan designs and what can happen, you can kind of hold off your plan so you don't have to put health care reform in place if you do certain requirements. Michaels decided we're going to go and we're not going to be self or we're not going to be grandfather. We're going to go right into the um, new plans and change the design to match whatever the federal mandates were. So. Within that, um, we again, we're trying to encourage those folks, think about your wellness, go and get your wellness physicals. A couple of years ago, instead of charging people for a colonoscopy, we set $100 co-pays. You know, we always thought it was very reasonable if employees went to get a doctor's visit that they paid a $20 copay. It gets them involved in the cost of the plan. Well, under the recent health care reform, not only can they not pay the $100 copay for the colonoscopy because they have to be covered at 100% under wellness, but they can't pay the $20 copay either. We feel that was very affordable, a $20 copay. We tried to maintain those low costs for the employees, but just for them to understand that it does cost to go to the doctor. We wanted them to include that. 
Well, the cost to our plan for loss of that $20 copay for the wellness exams was 2% of our premiums. Now, that doesn't seem like much until you figure out that if you have a $10 million plan, that can be a substantial amount that's come back to the plan. Now, Michael's always encouraged wellness. Michael's always paid for these same, very same services. We've not changed what benefits were paid under the plan, but now we've lost that $20 copay. That is a cost that's coming back to Michael's. Now, those are just some of the costs that we're seeing come back into our pocket versus the employees. Our employees have a very low copay. Again, we encourage our employees to have good health care, so we've always tried to keep their costs very low for out of pocket. So at this point, they pay 12% of the premium. So now that premium is actually, you know, that 12% is still very low. How much more are we going to have to force back onto them with the mandates? And that's one of our major concerns is what will be coming back to the employer and how much will it affect our costs. So if I'm looking at Sheila's 8% a year, and unfortunately I haven't seen an 8% increase in the last three or four years. I've seen 9%, I've seen 11%, we've seen 13% on our basic claims cost, and we've seen somewhere in the neighborhood upward of 40% on our stop loss. So there's a substantial amount of that going back to the employer. So from our perspective, we want to insure our people, we want healthy employees to be at Michaels Corporation, but there is a significant cost shift back to the employers on some of these things that we've been already providing. Especially, there's a lot of good employers in this area and um, that have been providing good benefits. Unfortunately, many of the small employers are very uh, heavily impacted by these costs and, and how much it does cost to insure people. So right now, we have a choice where we can look at paying a $2,000 penalty for our employees, and that would be at about $140,000 versus the uh, $15,000 it costs to insure the uh, average employee now and somewhere in the neighborhood at 10.2 million. If our competitors all decide that they're going to go to the $2,000 and pay the penalty, we are going to have a pretty tough time trying to compete with them in the marketplace and, and win jobs and build construction projects if we have to pay $10 million and they're only paying $200,000. So those are just some of the concerns that we have about um, the health care reform and while we don't try and judge is it right or is it wrong, um, we are trying to just in, in implement as we're incur you know as as it's indicated in the practices, whether it's a uh, lifetime limits removal or, or excluding uh, coverages for pre-existing conditions and some of those things, we're just trying to deal with the day-to-day -day kind of um, activity at Michaels. So. Just one additional comment because um, I noticed that there's probably several students in this room and so we did our homework as well. Um, as, as you talk about different employers looking at the opt-out program, um, as recent as spring of 2010, um, some of the country's largest companies conducted feasibility studies. So this isn't just Michael's, this is the country and talking to large employers. AT&T, for example, revealed that it spends $2.4 billion annually on coverage for its 300,000 employees. If they chose that opt-out, if they decided to do that opt-out, um, their number would fall to $600 million. Again, economically, we're not even talking about this as, as a decision, but it really becomes, what does the company want to do? What do they believe in? They want to value their people. We value their health. Um, we know that it's smart and wise to offer a good, solid health plan, which is what Janet had talked about before. We've done that over the past years. Um, the Health Care Reform Act is just making it a little bit more difficult and putting some increased costs on us that necessarily we didn't have to absorb, but it's, it's looking like it's going to cost us almost a quarter of a million dollars just doing nothing, just because of the new mandates. Thank you very much. You've gotten a real dose of the reality from uh, several of the most important perspectives. Recognizing that some of you need to go on to classes, let me break a little bit from the tradition here and see if any of those who need to leave have a question. Anyone who can't stay for later discussion have a question? Students, please, chime right in. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any hands stand up if I'm missing you. Okay, well, I want to thank you for your rapt attention. I hope all of you can stay for the session because this has been extraordinarily useful. I guess everyone really can't stay. But, uh, no questions. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm um, going to deviate from the role of the usual moderator in the launch discussion by turning first then to the panel, see if any of them have questions of their other fellow panelists. 
I serve often on panels and discover that's an interesting way to discussion. So I've jotted down a few thoughts, but let me turn to the panelists and see um, any questions for one another <coughs> to elaborate a point or um, uh, get a little more clarity. Because I, I thought all of you did beautiful jobs of addressing the interactions between your daily routines and business futures and uh, uh, health reform. Well, I just want to make a comment here. Sure. Make it to Dr. Merrick because, as an employer, we really value our primary care physicians, and we have the um, we work nationally with many different areas of the country. And some of our folks in in different parts of the country are unable to get satisfactory primary care services. In fact, they've seen in some parts of the country where there's been exodus of primary care physicians. So, as an employer, I'm concerned for that, and and I'm glad that we are. We are in Wisconsin, and we still have some great medical services here. So I, I feel sad for my folks out in the Seattle area who have seen a change in their um, access and the um, number of providers in their area. Mm -hmm. And there's other folks um, that I deal with in, in North Dakota when we talk about uh, having access network uh, to the network. Well, for them to have access to the network, a lot of times we talk about a 10 to 25 mile range. You have access to a doctor. Well, they all know it takes 100 miles to get to a doctor. So we are very fortunate in Wisconsin to have the, the medical community that we do. So, Please. Dr. Merrick. I hear it making noise. So. Well, I was like... Well, maybe not. Maybe that's me making noise. Three seconds, they say. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, the big problem is going to be um, the, having the providers to um, you know, provide for this new population. Um, you know, the, the important thing is that it's not only the people in their 50s and 40s and things like that, but it's the Medicare population that's going to be expanding tremendously. Um, this year, um, 7,000 baby boomers are going to change, are going to be turns the age 65 per day, and they're going to be going on Medicare. You're looking at a very large population that has to be cared for. As they get older, as I pointed out in, in some of those examples, their illnesses become very complex. We have more technology. We have more options for these people. Um, the example that I gave showed the expenditure of a person basically in the last three, four months of their life. CAT scans, uh, dialysis, and things like that. Somebody has to make the decision on which direction to go and which resources to use. No matter who pays for it, no matter if it's government, if it's private insurance, as long as we utilize these resources like that, the cost is going to be unsustainable. Healthcare reform or no healthcare reform, it's going to be unsustainable. In that example that I gave as, as, as an illustration, that 86-year-old female who came to a, a primary care physician's you know, office and had some advice. I, so we're down to, should we continue dialysis, continue with the medications, or should we stop everything and put her on hospice? As a question, who would want to continue dialysis? I mean, just thinking about it. Or who would want to give her you know, on hospice? The primary care physician has to make that determination. And if you could look at the impact of that decision, and the cost, if we continue dialysis, the cost is extraordinary. What if we decide to get some more uh, imaging studies for that mass that she has? The cost is extraordinary. This is one of the greatest costs in our society right now is this overuse of, of inappropriate use of this, um, uh, this um, you know, these technologies. As a primary care physician, that example that I gave you is that I'd have to use evidence-based research or medical, you know, science, basically. There is a study that shows that if somebody has bad heart disease and they're on dialysis, or if they have bad heart disease, they have the same bad kidneys and they're off dialysis, they're going to live the same lifespan. It's not going to make a difference. So somebody has to make that decision and counsel the family and say, we could either keep you on dialysis, you could be on these, on these medications, you could have a terrible life, basically. You could live the same length of time, you could be on hospice and have some comfort. 
That's a very difficult decision to make. Unless we make those decisions on primary care level, the cost is going to continue to go out of control. Um, you know, unfortunately, our system doesn't value that decision-making process. It values the, you know, the CAT scan, the cardiac catheterization. There's another thing, point about this, it's very uncoordinated. You know, every little specialist does his thing, and that's it. Nobody puts the whole picture together. So unfortunately, the escalation of cost is going to be a problem. There's going to be less people that are willing to do this particular function, which is going to reduce the access. And um, access to primary care is going to be limited. One comment I wanted to add to what uh, Janet and Karen had mentioned was uh, what I typically see is as the benefit mandates come in, uh, employers, most of them are at the point where they, they've kind of reached their limit as to how much uh, they can absorb in increasing health care costs. And so those changes, uh, for the most part, get passed 100% on to the employees. It typically doesn't show up as additional premium contribution by the employees. It typically shows up by the employer either increasing co-pays or increasing uh, deductibles. In fact, this January, uh, the average deductible for all of the plans we sold was $1,500. That is a significant out-of-pocket. A few years ago, it was more like uh, 250, but we've hit the ceiling on uh, what uh, employers can afford and still remain competitive. What's your pocket shield? The average out of pocket. Average out. The question is, what's the average out of pocket? Because I'm not so concerned with the deductible. I want to know what does my person pay in the end? Because um, while the deductible is there, there's always a maximum they should be paying. Typically, family five thousand. So the typical family, if they had a situation, they're going to, you know, maybe they had a baby. $5,000 out of pocket. Um, and I, the last comment that I wanted to make, and I apologize, I didn't close with this, is that I have concerns with the future points and the mandates where I have to encourage or, or further shift costs to under our employees because there's going to be some um, taxation uh, on various benefits or some... Um, kind of steering us in the direction as an employer as to what the deductibles should be. And our 300, 600 deductible will be gone and our employees will be forced somewhere in 2,000 to 4,000. And, and I'm concerned as an employer because um, of that cost shifting. Bobby, did you have anything you wanted to contribute on the point? So I'm going to ask a question going in a different direction, so let's finish this one. No, I'm not trying to rush. Just, you know. um, my uh, thought is, I guess, to Dr. Merritt, and it relates to uh, something I read several years ago and this uh, strong point of emphasis on primary care uh, prevention. Um, and it's a, it's a tough issue to, to think about, but it's one that um, I'm wondering what, the, what, what his perspective is on, on uh, a real strong emphasis on primary care and prevention, but then the the result in being really no cost savings to the system because you're basically uh, just increasing the uh, end state end stage of life issues for um, the high cost of care later on. And uh, is there? Um, I don't know what the answer to that is. I just I wanted to raise that question. I mean, if I can interpret this, it sounds like you're saying, why do all this primary care preventative stuff? Because these people are going to live long, and we have to take care of them. Well, no, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm wondering if, if, if we have a, a strong point of emphasis on primary care prevention mm -hmm. as a mechanism to save money, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and is it going to result in greater mobility, morbidity for uh, issues of... Uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, long-term care needs that, are, you know, it's not, it, it's, it, it's done for other reasons, not necessarily just to save money. So I guess that's what yes, there, done. Yes, there, there's going to be, there's going to be demand on the system. I mean, there's no question about it, and I agree. And it's basically because it's the population dynamics. I mean, you're going to have an expanding Medicare population, no matter if they're sick or not sick, you know, I mean, you have to do something about that. The, 
you know, we didn't, we, we talk about preventative care and everybody's thinking about getting your, your immunizations, getting your um, colonoscopy, you know, making sure your cholesterol is right. But there's another issue that is extraordinarily burdensome on uh, this economy right now, and that's management of chronic, chronic um, medical illnesses. There's about five or six of them that have been identified. Congestive heart failure, diabetes, one of the ones that I've alluded to, uh, asthma, uh, coronary artery disease, psychiatric problems. Identifying these, and if these are poorly controlled, these are a, a very high percentage of our expenditures. So when you talk about primary care, its usefulness is not only getting your immunizations, but it's managing chronic pro problems. As an example, I gave with this diabetic, um, you know, I, I mean, I, it was a little draconian where he wouldn't show up. That does happen sometimes. The point is that he had to take care of himself. The other point, if he doesn't, if we don't manage that, that particular illness properly, he uses the system wrong. He goes and he, he ends up with the complications, which are very costly. He could have spent, I mean, he could have spent the money to manage his diabetic, uh, which maybe, you know, I don't know how much that would be a year for uh, maybe 5000 or something like that. Yet if we don't do that, he goes in, into, if we don't manage that, control those problems, he gets sick from the complications, goes to the ICU, and probably in two weeks of the ICU, he probably racked up of seventy, eighty thousand, fifty thousand dollar. That's probably somewhere around there. That's the problem. That's what we're looking at when we look at primary care services. It's the essential management of chronic diseases that are very burdensome to our our our, our um, um, population. I mean, just <laughs> sure. Go go. I mean, as an example, the trend yeah, is real. Well, and as, as, as an example, um, you know, they're looking at specific illnesses, and people that are involved in the hospital are, are familiar with this. But if we look at congestive heart failure, we want to have these teams to manage congestive heart failure. Because what happens if a person has congestive heart failure? They repetitively go into the hospital for this problem. So even before healthcare reform, there was a, a limitation in, in progress of paying for congestive heart failure. In other words, if somebody shows up in, in the emergency room, gets admitted for congestive heart failure, after they're discharged, if they're admitted again within 30 days of having congestive heart failure, we don't get paid for it. So the motivation is, you better do something as an outpatient, control this illness, and not have them come in the hospital because it's too expensive. That's the role of coordination of care. That's the role of, of primary care. And that's some of the concepts behind the patient-centered medical home, which I have a definition in here. And, um, and also, the other one is the uh, bundled uh, payments. Okay. I don't know if that I'm going to ask one more question to the panel, but warn you right now, as soon as this one is dispatched, I'm coming up to you. Uh, Kevin this morning played Phil Donahue and um, Jerry Springer, so I guess it's me to be Eleanor Oprah. Sure. <laughs> um, I'll, so in, in just a few moments, you get to uh, start asking your questions. So prepare them. But um, uh, just as this morning's panel, and in fact, I think everything I hear and read suggests we are really facing a worse situation in primary care reform as doing too little too late. We already arguably are far short of the primary care resources we could productively use in this country. And nothing suggests they're going to get better. Uh, we just can't train the people fast enough. As much as I hope many of you are motivated to become primary care practitioners, we need you sooner than you can become competently skilled, and certified, and ready to see patients. Um, so what are we going to do? And, and a couple of areas that have fascinated me over the years that I've done a lot of research in, and I'd like to know how payers and employers and uh, physicians feel about this. It's very clear, the ample research, I mean, you can quiz me on this if you want, although it's really for the panel, but I'll, I'll step in if need be. There's a lot of evidence about the, the amazing quality of management of chronic diseases by non-physicians who are qualified by the nurse practitioners, the clinical pharmacists, pregnancy problems, um, which I wouldn't expect a general internist to mention, um, uh, managed um, by, or, or at least prevented by, they generally would be managed by uh, obstetrician gynecologists, but prevented by um, a certified nurse midwife, um, what today's clinical pharmacists can do. Um, hundreds of articles that show that, that these non-physician practitioners can really get in and uh, fill the bill, but, and, and so can telemedicine 
Indeed, some of the best examples I've seen are physician-managed uses of telemedicine direct links into the patient's home through a video camera or through telemetry that uh, takes the samples and then lets the doc know when um, the patient is um, taking on a little weight gain for that congestive heart failure or showing the signs of a respiratory problem for an asthmatic. Um, they're the alternatives of the non-physician practitioners, the advanced practice nurses, which don't need to be explained here at Marion. We've got great programs leading in that direction. Um, the uh, pharmacists, who you may not know as much about because you don't have a pre-pharmacy program, is my understanding. And then, of course, using the technologies to extend all of the above, but particularly to extend the physicians. I'd be interested in having each of you respond to what you think needs to be done, or perhaps, depending on your point of view, shouldn't be done, to help us meet crying primary care needs using technologies and non-physician practitioners when we know, it was positive this morning, and the AAMC says this, we just can't produce them fast. Physicians fast enough, what are we going to do? And how will employers, payers, social welfare um, deal with that? OK, sure, uh, let's, let's start with Sheila. One of the things that um, I didn't mention is Network Health Plan is a wholly owned subsidiary of Affinity Health System. And Affinity Health System is a healthcare delivery system that includes uh, physician clinics and hospitals. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is piloting within our physician clinics the patient-centered medical home concept, which includes partnering the physician with advanced nurse practitioners, with uh, clinical pharmacists, and uh, behavioral health uh, and social service aspect. And while we uh, only have uh, about 5,000 members in medical homes at this point in our pilot, what we have found is a 40% reduction in hospital uh, admission rates, a 30% reduction in emergency room visits, and a significant, I can't remember off the top of my head, reduction in visits to specialists, and about a 30% increase in primary care visits. So we really are starting to see if you organize the physician's office, because primary care physicians are scarce, if you organize them within a team so that they have time to focus on uh, those aspects that need their attention, the rest of the team can work to uh, assist the whole person needs of each patient, which includes uh, care management. Okay. Uh, one of our hopes is that over time within the health plan that we can transition so that the health plan isn't the one doing the care management, that those resources are actually in the clinic, the physician's offices, and that we're able to spread that model out to uh, non-affinity physicians and, and the same with the payment method that we're working on to support that. I'm sitting here saying, way to go. Yeah, you got my strong endorsement. Are you paying? Are, are you, uh, Kevin and Dr. Fickinger has already talked about the need to make sure that there's a financial incentive. Can I take it from your comments? You're providing resources to see this happen? We're providing resources right now as seed money, and then we're going through a process to say, how do we completely change the reimbursement method to either some type of shared okay. risk or shared savings or quality related components so that. Um, can you please use a microphone because otherwise we can't, it's not being okay. recorded. Okay. okay. I'm sorry about that. I, I didn't realize that, uh, okay, we'll make sure it never happens again. But uh, <laughs> there's some good, there, there, there are some real neat paper topics there. 
um, looking into the, the, the shifts and the, the reimbursement system and the assignment of different ways to get things done. So um, if you're wondering what's a taper topic, I, I, if I were your professor, I'd, oh, I'd love a couple of those. Bobby? Um, yeah, I think that uh, you know, it, the trend towards uh, greater use of you know, the allied health professionals and others in, in providing services when we're dealing with crushing costs is, is going to continue. I think that the concern is just that making sure it doesn't uh, sacrifice uh, quality uh, and people are getting the appropriate care that they need. And you know, there, there will be continued turf issues and sharp el elbows at the edges of, of those you know, areas. I think that um, in an analogous area, which I know a little bit more about, when we talk about providing help to patients in the health benefits area, we also have this area of a continuum of knowledge from the most advanced areas, which is the medical legal integration of medical records, insurance contracts, government programs, and trying to understand someone's eligibility for a program, to the basic information that the consumer needs to know about their health coverage. And we've been working very hard at trying to figure out that continuum of knowledge and understanding what the various levels of capacity and competency relate at each level. Mm -hmm. and using tools to measure that competency and capacity. And I think it's analogous here because we need to make sure that what's the consumer's responsibility for their care? What's the information that you know, a, a, a personal care worker might be responsible for? Um, uh, an LPM, a nurse practitioner, primary care physician, specialty physician, and how does, it, how does, that, how does that knowledge transfer? When do you reach your level of competency and pass it on to the next level? Um, we're doing that in, in the health benefits area, and I think it's a very important uh, uh, area for analysis. But it's also what we find is that, uh, at least in our testing of it, because we've actually developed some tools, some competency and capacity tools in, in, our, in, in our work, that people really either underestimate or overestimate their competency in certain skill sets. And I think that ongoing measurement and study and analysis of that is going to be important to make sure that you're, you're, you're making sure you're, you're getting the services in the, in the correct area. To take it home in a little more practical area, I think that when we look at the dental shortage uh, or the, the, the lack of access to dental services in Wisconsin, it really is the product of a, there, there aren't enough dentists in the state in some, some regard. And in Minnesota, they dealt with it by creating an extra layer of services that hygienists are able to provide basic, you know, uh, cavities and, and you know, basic dental services that aren't allowed in Wisconsin. This is the extension of services to uh, a, a, a different area, a different profession beyond the dentist, but it causes a lot of debate and concern here in Wisconsin because you're allowing dental hygienists to do something that, you know, someone had to learn in dental school. And so the turf issues collide with the fact that we don't have enough dentists. We don't have enough people to provide basic primary care dental services out there in the community beyond what a hygienist has. And I think those debates will continue. Okay, um, thank you. Janet, I think you were re reaching for a mic. I, I find this very interesting because I'm learning a lot today. I hope you all are as well. From the employer perspective, um, we're in the construction business, so we like to think, see things fixed. And, and I think anything that takes it outside the box the, the normal stuff's not going to fix this. I mean, we've got to think outside the box on fixing this problem. Whether it's bringing people in, hygienists, to do basic skill sets, whether it's providing um, a local uh, station 100 miles where my employee lives, so all they got to do is walk up to Walgreens and talk to the doctor in uh, Sioux Falls. Whatever it takes, that's what we're looking for, some, some different answers, because and, and I think we're looking for many of the experts like we have in the room here to, to, to lead us in that direction because we know what the system is. We just have to find a better way to fix it. And I think we need to really think outside the box. I don't mind if the, you know, the hygienist provides a service. You know, my insurance plan is going to pay for um, a counseling session with a nutritionist because it makes sense, not because it's not financially, fiscally responsible or not because it's not provided by the doctor. It's sometimes a matter of, while I like the holistic approach, sometimes I do need um, the, you know, the best man available to take care of whatever the needs are. So yes, technology, we're for it. I mean, it really, um, we've used it in a lot of different ways at Michael's too, and I'm gonna let Karen share one of those examples now. And that's coming your way, so get ready. Well, 
Well, one of the things that um, we have done is um, we have a, a nurse care line uh, available 24-7. It's, it's available to all of our employees. It's a benefit. Michael's pays for that. People can use that to call for um, that question about a child's illness. Um, we also use that in terms of if there is an injury or incident on the job, we have that person getting involved immediately too. Um, and then of course, with our insurance programs on some of those more chronic um, issues, there's case management. Uh, again, people are put on that to follow up and make sure that the employee, again, is taken care of. Our, you know, our bottom line concern is the concern for the employee and making sure they're getting the best health care. So. Thank you. I forgot Dr. Merrick, so you have, you have one more three minute warning before I come on the audience. But I'd like to respond to some of the panelists, um, um, what they said, and also to your question about health information technology, how we're going to use technology. Um, you know, um, providers such as nurse practitioners, PAs, uh, and they're often related to the health centered uh, medical home. Um, the Health Center Medical Home has been a demonstration project around, since I've been around since, um, 2006. The problem that we have right now is definitions of, this, of the um, patient center medical home is what kind of standards do we have. There are some agencies out there that are producing a standard. As for the technology, when you mentioned, you know, we could, we could um, have across state lines and things like that, that's being looked at in the, what we call the high-tech law health information technology for economic and clinical health. So we're trying to incorporate other electronic medical systems into our system. We have, we have electronic medical system at this time, but it's not necessary just to have it, it's necessary to actually have what we call meaningful use. In other words, we have to really show that this is helping patients. Some of the stuff that we talk about may be duplicative, such as some of the, um, you know, the surveillance by health, by insurance companies, and what we do as a clinic, such as outcomes. I mean, we have that data, hemoglobin A1Cs, medications, you know. So unfortunately, it's not clear exactly where we're going with this. We're going into a um, system where everybody has their ideas of how this is how this is going to be run. Hopefully, we'll become to some uniform conclusion so we don't have duplicative services. Okay, thank you very much. Who, where do I get the mic that I'm supposed to use one of these? Or? Yeah. Okay, may I use that mic? Now, I, as I come out into the audience, I don't want you to think that I'm either going to dance or give you a free trip to Ireland or a car or anything like that. Um, I'm just uh, seeking a different role. But uh, happily, we have a question to break the ice from the audience. I get my exercise just like Kevin did. Glad it's on the back row. Hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, thank Mr. Peterson for your work with ABC for Health. Um, I work at the health department, and Aaron and Bryn McBride have been incredibly helpful to me um, over the years, so thank you. Um, I have two questions, and one, the first is specific for you, Mr. Peterson. What do you see as the future for Badger Care Plus prenatal program? Badger Care, is that working? No. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the red light. It's green. Okay, now we got it. Badger Care Plus prenatal is a, a program that was uh, it was a bipartisan program that started during the Doyle administration, but it was a, a split administration. The Senate controlled the, the, or the Republicans controlled the Senate at the time, and the Democrats, they said, would be vice versa. But it was a program that was designed for uh, non-qualified <coughs> immigrants that were here uh, who were pregnant. And if they have a child in this country, it is going to be a citizen. And we were seeing tremendous expenses for women that were delaying prenatal care, having poor birth outcomes, and again, you know, those expenses were getting spread to everyone. The Badger prenatal program provided an opportunity for non-qualified immigrant pregnant women to get prenatal care services to make sure that they had appropriate prenatal care and that birth outcomes were um, because they were having access to prenatal care. 
I, at this point, it's, um, it's a program that's targeted. It's a program that could be eliminated as a part of the budget um, uh, or part of the uh, changes that the DHS secretary has related to flexibility within Medicaid uh, through rulemaking. Uh, there are certain services that are required to be provided under Medicaid law. Um, my understanding is that the Badger Care Prenatal Program is not one of them, so it, it could be eliminated. I think it could be short-sighted. Again, it's a, it's a program that could result in costs increasing and getting shifted uh, to everybody else. So no matter how you feel about you know, the immigration issue, um, these are our children that are born here and under the law are citizens, and they will be you know, um, entitled to certain medical services as such. And without the appropriate coverage for their parents um, and their mothers, those expenses could be very significant. You said you have one more, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, this may be too big a question, but could each of you talk about what a good, economically viable health system looks like? It might make us all crazy because we're so far away from that, but what would a good one look like in this country? Well, that is a big question. <laughs> Clearly, you know, when I talked about rationing and talked about some of the privileges and rights, the concepts involved with that, there's going to have to be, everything's going to have to be in there. Um, the big thing is that we do have to really figure out what we're paying for. That's a vital interest right now. We're paying for too much. There's no question about that. We're not going to get any costs under control until we come to that you know, conclusion of what we're going to pay for, what we expect. We're going to have to have a system that is responsible in all manners. You know, physicians are responsible, as I talked about. Also, we have to have a public that's also responsible to some degree. It's not going to work. So basically, controlling costs, directing people in appropriate use of um, uh, resources, um, having some shared responsibility, and they talked about other options of doing that. That's probably what we, do, we need to do. Yeah, pass the mic on down the line. I think if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> be in some think tank somewhere. Um, I, I, I would agree that uh, one of the biggest issues is making sure that uh, we deliver the right care in the, um, in the right setting and that all of the parties are working together across uh, the continuum, uh, focusing on what is in the best interest of each and every individual. Uh, but in addition, and, and so reaching some consensus on what works and what doesn't. Uh, I know one of the pushbacks that uh, I give to our medical committee all the time and what the medical committee does is it determines as things move from experimental to, um, to being proven, why all we do is keep adding more stuff because if it's taking, if it's better than something else, why aren't we taking away uh, those other services? Why do we continue to pay for something that is perceived to be uh, inferior? So, and I'm hoping that the, um, I guess the, what's it called, the evidence, the clinical, the comparative effect of this research, um, I'm hopeful that uh, that will give us some guidance in that area. But another area that's just as important is how do we create a system where we are accountable for our own actions. Uh, so much of healthcare cost is actually avoidable and is created by the choices that we make every single day. Uh, just a very, I guess, simple example is um, we now uh, on all of our insured products, we reward our diabetic members for taking better care of themselves, for going in and seeing the doctor to get their A1C in line to make sure that they get their eye exam. Uh, the compliance went up significantly, and we're talking a couple hundred dollars. Uh, and it just amazes me that we need somebody to reward us to actually do what is in our own personal uh, best interest. 
Uh, and so I think somehow we have to build into the system that personal accountability. So if we ride a motorcycle, we wear our helmets, all of the things that we know we should be doing, uh, but somehow we assume that others should be accountable for paying if, uh, if we happen to be harmed by our own actions. Well, we actually, uh, at ABC for Health, after you know, being in the trenches for 10 years of providing services to individuals, so uh, I think it was 2003 when I, we came out with our first iteration of what we called the Pathway Plan. And it was our attempt to try and make sense of what uh, an appropriate healthcare system would look like. And, you know, we know the, the split in the debate, you know, to oversimplify, but we have free market healthcare, Healthcare savings accounts on one end. We have government-run healthcare on the other end of the continuum, and and I, I, you know, both ends of that spectrum give me pause at some level. Um, I, I said earlier in my remarks that um, I I really appreciate the opportunities for a public-private partnership in healthcare, and I think that the way the Badger Care program has developed with a large-scale pool. I mean, we need to emphasize insurance is about pooling. You know, when we look at the Badger Care program, we've got 775,000 people in that pool. Some very sick people, a lot of healthy kids, uh, but it's an opportunity to spread that risk in a pool. And yeah, you might you might be in that pool, and you might be um, you know having uh, payments made, or or you might be making premium payments. But you're you're taking on this idea that it's a, it's we, it's we, and we're we're in this together. In, in health and in health insurance. And we ought to be working together. We ought to be working, taking personal responsibility. We ought to be trying to promote our health. We ought to be trying to promote best outcomes and, and the best way to, to spend these dollars. I think that if we shift too far over to individualized health savings accounts, consumer-driven health care becomes the team of me. And we forget about all of us in this room and how we need to work on this together. Uh, it's a shared responsibility at some level. We have personal responsibility, but there's a bigger shared responsibility that we have. We've made the decision that we're going to have, you know, our roads, our police and fire protection. And I don't hear people talking about our socialized road system or our socialized police force. But those are just like, those are things that we have decided as a society that it's better off that we do this together. But I don't think handing over you know, just telling the government to say you take the healthcare system and run it yourself, and, and I don't think that's what's happening in, in, in healthcare reform. I don't think that's what happens in, in the Badger Care program. I think it's an opportunity for government oversight, government regulation at some level, uh, strong consumer protections, which I think are really important because people need to have confidence that when they're using the healthcare system, that they have certain rights. They should know what's in that contract. That's you know, talk about your health insurance card. To me, that's your rationing card, because that tells you, you know, what's going to be covered and what's not going to be covered. There's a contract behind your little health insurance card that's full of legal mumbo jumbo that says we'll pay for this, we'll pay for that, we'll pay for medically necessary services unless someone else in the school is going to pay for those therapy services. I mean, there's a lot of language like that. So my system is really one that would be a public-private partnership, strong consumer protections, using the concepts of pooling, unified systems of administration to help drive down costs, and also leverage costs, because large pools can also exert leverage on the system to help drive down costs. Share those discounts, share those opportunities to drive down costs with employers, let them buy into uh, a larger pool like that. Have a system of benefits that's more uniform than hodgepodge that it is right now where we have mandates in Wisconsin, self-funded plans that don't apply to the mandates, uh, and other plans that, that partially apply to some of the mandates. It costs a lot more confusion, and it increases cost. Okay. Thank you. Let's see what the Michaels sisters have to say. Oh, the Michaels sisters. Well, we, we got the same notes here, but I'm, I'm taking Bobby's plan. Okay. I, I like a lot of you know what my panel members have said to this point uh, concerning this topic. but. Uh, again, we're all for personal account accountability. There has to be personal accountability. Um, and I'm also for the less government, more involvement from the, the stakeholders. I'm going to give you an example of why, as an employer, this kind of drives me crazy kind of law. 
Last year, I had a call after Missouri had mandated uh, coverage for uh, age 26, and they had their state mandate versus a federal mandate, and I got a call from a mother, and she said, um, I have the Michaels Open Enrollment paperwork, and I'm helping my son fill out his health insurance forms, and I see you have an opt-out provision if he has other coverage, and I said, yes, we do have an opt-out provision. You know, if the person has other coverage, they can opt out of our coverage, and they can get a per, you know, a per diem for not taking the coverage, but you have to prove coverage. Well, my son is under the age of 26, and I can insure him on my coverage, because I'm a government employee in Missouri, under our family plan, and then he can get the money from Michaels, correct? And I said, yes, theoretically that is correct. He can stand your coverage because the government said you must cover your son, even though he has coverage from, from Michaels, she could continue him on her plan. And then he could also get the money from Michaels. And I said, you know, I would encourage you to enroll him in the, his employer's plan. It's free. Um, but they chose at that point to go on his mother's insurance versus going on the Michaels insurance so that they could double dip the system. And you know, folks, I'm all for health care reform and fixing the problems, but we got to make sure that we don't create more problems. Michaels doesn't mind paying for our folks to have insurance. That's why we gave them free health insurance. But we can't let people double the system either. So I think there are definitely some snafus we got to work out. So as we go through the next couple years here and in this transition, I think we're going to see hopefully some of those snafus work through so that we have some of these uh, equitable coverages going on through the, through the system. I'll just add, um, yeah, Janet and I were sharing a few notes, and again, when it comes to business, um, that's one of our key words back at Michaels is accountability, and I mean, it can just be used again as we're talking about the health care reform and in many other of the topics that we're talking about. Um, to Janet's example, you know, in the end, this person is double dipping, and it's going to cost us more in the, in the long run, and, you know, us being the employer is also going to have to have some cost sharing with our employees, so... Again, lesson learned for all of us. Okay. Great question. Okay. Next question. Sister, right here. Don't get my exercise. Um, I work here at Marion, and I have a couple observations and question. And I think I'm a relatively intelligent person, but it finally just hit me this year as I joined with the wellness committees having a weight loss thing. You know, they do every January. So I'm in that with people for obvious reasons. And I'm going over to her uh, Monday morning to weigh in. And this thing ends in April or May or whatever. And I suddenly went, you know, this nurse here at Marion is not just for the students that I always have thought of it that way. She's really not here in the summer and she wasn't here at spring break week. But I could really be going and weighing in. She could be a person I could be accountable to every week during the year. <laughs> and not just take it as a student. Because Marion, I am on Marion's insurance. And this whole accountability piece that you're talking about, um, where do we trigger that to help everybody understand now their role? I, I'm a sister of St. Agnes, and we've been doing the durable power of attorney and our role, and I understand very much the, um, I teach ethics in the doctoral program here, so when we talk about leadership and ethics, we've had discussions, or I've had people come in and talk about end of life issues and what is it like? What percentage is it, 60 or 70 percent of healthcare that's spent in the last 30 days of life? And so how much money as a society we're putting in, and we've had discussions in the congregation about that, when sisters know they have a terminal illness, and at what point do we make the responsible decision with our belief system that we're ready to go to see God face to face, and we don't need to be spending additional money for an end of life. And I'm talking about the palliative care doing it in a responsible way, right? We've had that discussion. But I also, I, I'm comparing the two things because as a person who's talked about responsible choices in many ways, I sometimes don't come back and look at my own responsible, even something as simple as using a resource in my place of employment. And I think that dialogue of making people be responsible and own it is something different because we've been used to going to the doctor and having them tell us what to do instead of saying, how do I take ownership and come into this? And another piece that triggers me with this is I work with hourly employees at Marion. 
who when they go to the doctor or take time for something, they, then they have to figure out, they're looking at their hours and we have that discussion. And I was sitting here thinking, you know, we have vacation days and we have holidays and maybe as a nation we need to have health care days. That you really have, as, a, as I look at Michael's, I don't know, do you let people, if they go to the doctor, because I think, the, Dr. Merrick, the example you gave of that person who didn't go for those appointments, and you're thinking, if his work job, that first person, that with, when he got done the grain king with his leg, and I'm thinking, both legs amputated, if he'd just gone to the doctor earlier, maybe Eddie wouldn't have lost his job. If they, the place of employment would have said, you're allowed a day for a physical or, you know, like you're, the, you know, like two days a year are days we expect you to go to the doctor and you get paid for those days, but we need to know you went to the doctor. You bring back a thing to say you had your physical or whatever. So, do Michaels, do you let people go and maybe you both can respond to this, whoever else in some way. Um, to the first part of your question regarding, um, you know, how do you help make people more accountable? Um, what we have found, and it's, it's far from perfect, but you know, a little incentivizing them to do that, and we have wellness programs where, again, um, in case of, you know, what we end up doing is there's certain different um, things that they can pick, and if they do a couple of those, they can essentially have a month free of paying a premium payment. So Janet and myself were part of a, a also a, a training tour that we're talking to our employees every year, and you're trying to put that in, in front of them, um, and yet our participation was not the greatest, and we're talking to people saying you left $500 on the table last year. You know, um, and again, but you have to just keep communicating, you have to keep talking to them about trying to make it it's something important for them um, to want to seek out and do. Um, with regards to your second part of your question on um, having a, a doctor day off or um, something how you phrased it, um, you know, again, we believe in people need to take care of themselves and they make their appointments. And most people are responsible and they're making appointments either at the end of the day or the beginning of the day. And, you know, I, I guess what, what we don't see is necessarily individuals not choosing to go into a doctor because they have to work. They're choosing to go in because they don't think they have to until it gets to be too late or a, a situation. Especially in our own organization, as, as we do offer a very strong health plan, they know they can walk in. They And again, um, do we have the take your day off to go to the doctor? No. Um, is it a, a, a novel idea, something that we'd like to you know talk about as we talk about promoting the wellness and health of our employees? Absolutely. But unfortunately, there are a little bit of those concerns in terms of economics and you know, we do allow people to make sure that they can go and seek the treatment that they need, and they're they're never they're never reprimanded for it or anything. Or somebody's not going to lose their job because they're going in to see a, a doctor to take care of themselves. Um, but again, uh, you know, an interesting idea. But we try to promote it on the on the beginning part. You know, the preventative part and taking care and you know joining a fitness club and and making sure you're doing a health risk assessment or going in for your preventive exam. And and again, you know, here you go. We're going to give you money to do that. And, and help you, you know, kind of incentivize you to do that. Any other panelists with a response? Or? I'm going to let Bobby probably comment to this one because I think it brings up a, a different piece that we're not here really to talk about today, but it is that sometimes people can't financially afford to take off or work and get health treatment, and I bet you have a few things to say about that. Well, yes, I think that uh, we know that there are folks out there that, you know, can't afford to take time off, and, and they are not allowed sick time to go to the doctor. So um, it's just the reality. I think that it collides with personal responsibility and, uh, and what is the employer responsibility. And I think that there have to be mechanisms to help uh, allow people to, um, to, to have time to go to the doctor or take a sick child or a sick family member. I mean, I've been um, the, the, the primary person taking care of my, uh, uh, my mom for the last nine years and, and fortunately I can leave work and take her to her appointments and make sure she's getting, you know, and, and monitoring it and being her healthcare navigator and do those things for her. But I know that for a lot of people they don't have that opportunity. They can't leave work. Uh, and that uh, I think we have to be very careful when we, when we look at personal responsibility. And I think that we all can agree that, there's, there, there, that we can 
we can ask for more personal responsibility, but what about when it collides with other policies that prevent you from really being able to take some personal responsibility? And what about those situations where um, personal responsibility collides with ongoing chronic illness and you're punished because you have an ongoing chronic illness as well. So it's, it's something that we need to take a lot of care, for, care with uh, and not punish people for being sick. Do our best to promote them to, to maintain their wellness if, if they can. Uh, but it's a real tough, tough issue. Well, I think you had a, uh, that one example that I gave of that one particular individual. Um, yes, you make some good points that they may be limited by their you know, losing insurance, obviously, uh, but their work restriction may be a problem. Why people are non-compliant is a complexity. Um, some people have the opportunities to do that, and some people just choose not to. In my practice, I think the vast majority of people understand the, in, you know, the importance of the management of these chronic uh, illnesses. There is a, a proportion of the uh, population that doesn't, and they run into these problems. It becomes very expensive. Um, you know, how to mandate responsibility is a quagmire. You know, uh, we don't know how to do that. And if we have a ethical way to do that anymore, then... <laughs> you made another point about the, um, just quickly, about the um, getting weighed. Who was that? You're getting weighed by the... The nurse that And, um, you know, looking at the patient-centered medical uh, home model, it's not restricted to just somebody that's in healthcare. Okay, it, it can be opened up to um, programs at the YMCA, but it is, you know, administered by somebody, but there is community-based things that are going on that can be part of the uh, patient center medical home. We only have two minutes, so if you could be quick and then pass it to your seat well, there. And I just made, in two more questions. I just made that point about having the weight thing, because often it's just helpful to have somebody else that you're accountable to. And I have that in the values class. People come back and just say, I'm going to let you know that we did this when they make an action plan in their own life. So, um, and it's so simple that it can be around us, but we just don't use it the right way. Well, what, what, what you've, I, I just to go back, I'm sorry, but you, what you've identified is a resource that you found of value. And that's what we're trying to do is to find these community resources that we can incorporate in the patient medical home, home and use that hopefully for those particular ends. Um, I just wanted to add uh, that there are companies and there are in agencies that do incorporate St. Agnes now has an exercise room and those kinds of things and they're doing a wonderful job and it is difficult to go and find your own activities sometimes and there is that I want to do it but once I get home and the kids are demanding or this that or the other thing to get yourself out. So self-accountability becomes a little easier if the agency has something available right there. You can go earlier or later. Um, the other thing that I have seen in agencies is a sanity day, that everybody gets this one sanity day every other month. It's kind of like a sick day, it's a paid day, and they come back healthier and ready to go that it's just a day. They do have regulations usually that they can't be Mondays and Fridays uh, to extend long weekends type of thing. And I'm going to make a push for breastfeeding in the workplace. Uh, agencies are not providing breastfeeding, comfortable breastfeeding uh, stations for women and it is statistically proven that they have less mothers and less baby sick days that they have to pay out health um, monies for if all they do is provide a breastfeeding station that's comfortable and the mothers don't have to go pump in a bathroom stall. So I'm putting in a, a little advertisement there. American Academy of Pediatrics just joined you in that. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, students, please, I'd love to have another student question. Um, get a background for that paper. General audience question. Really? No other question. Alternative points of view. Wow. Um, oh, good. Yeah. 
I don't know if my contract allows me to let you go five minutes early or not. Please. Just save me an ethical dilemma. Last question. We do have only about five minutes left for the question and the discussion. Thank you. I'd like to hear a little bit more about the uh, patient care uh, centered model, you know, the medical model, because that sounds to me like something that would really work at uh, the team effort, really work at uh, spreading out the, the needs. What are, what are there? Are there any that are being conceived right now? Are there any operating right now in the system in Wisconsin? Are there any uh, that are being thought of? Um, and uh, what are the agencies that are being involved? I, I'm interested in more nitty gritty details if you have that. To, and then who pays the costs and, and the standards and definitions, some of that stuff. Uh, within uh, Affinity Medical Group, we have moved all of our primary care practices, with the exception of pediatrics, into a medical home model. Uh, our first two pilots, one was in uh, Kakana, the other one was in Oshkosh, have both been certified by NCQA as meeting NCQA's standards for medical home. So if you would have uh, a card or something, I could send you uh, some more information on how they're set up and what the NCQA standards are or any other type of information uh, that you would like. But it is something I, that I would anticipate that there are other uh, provider organizations that are moving toward medical home. The challenge is, is that it is a more expensive model than a standard primary care site, at least as NCQA uh, sees them. And uh, what has helped within Affinity is with Affinity owning a health insurance carrier network health plan, we're able to tailor our reimbursement with the clinic to kind of jointly support uh, that endeavor and at the same time see a benefit going uh, to our employer groups and to our members. It's a little harder uh, to work out those type of arrangements with a national carrier in order to get uh, the funding uh, necessary. And so I think that's one of the challenges is the, is the funding. Uh, you'll find things similar like at, uh, at Geisinger or some of the other integrated uh, systems. It's just a little easier to pull off and you can pull the funding in. Other panels? Um, well, the, the, the purpose of the patient-centered medical home was actually to, the, the original demonstration project by Medicare was to, they would look at it favorably if, if they fulfilled two criteria. Number one, the, the costs were the same, but the quality improved. Number two, the costs re, re, were reduced, but the quality still maintained as you, as you have it. So those are the things that we're looking for. And the purpose of this is to manage the chronic conditions. There's going to be, that's why we look at the question of what we pay for. Do we want to continue paying for the cardiac catheterization, the hemodynalysis, the complications of diabetes, or do we want to re, uh, 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 you know, take our finances and put them into other endeavors with the purpose of eventually saving money on the system? And that's, that's some of the concepts behind there. Yes, there may be a little extra cost in it, but that's the question, is what do we pay for? You want to pay for something like that that may provide, that prevent the complication rate of, of, um, of um, you know, chronic illnesses that are very expensive or not? Okay, thank you. Any other panelists who would care to respond? I'm going to do the exact, oh, please, Bobby. Real brief, I, you know, but, um, Working, we work a lot with uh, families, children, youth, and special health care needs. The medical home model uh, has been um, in that community for, I think, since I started in the late 80s. We started working on medical home issues uh, and trying to provide uh, better uh, integrated services for children with chronic illnesses and conditions to manage their services and care more carefully. So hopefully identify situations where you know, there are upfront costs that might be higher, but long-term expenses are lower um, because of better coordinated services. I think it's, it's seeing application out in a lot more areas, uh, and I think it's a really important development. Uh, it needs to be supported, uh, and I think in the area of chronic disease uh, management services, really, it's an important way to, uh, to, to help potentially uh, save costs and better manage care, and better manage services. And I know that the Wisconsin Medicaid program, it's one of the issues that they're going to be looking at pretty carefully. Thanks.
fixed data. This is a quick historical thing. Um, you mentioned the uh, you know chronic diseases in children. That's basically. I mean, this is not a a, a new concept. Uh, this was first initiated in the 1960s for the management of children's chronic diseases. So it's not a new concept. I'm going to end the same way Kevin did this morning and ask each of the panelists to uh, respond to a little surprising uh, challenge here. I'm a genie. I give you one wish for healthcare in the United States. So I would like to, Karen, I'll, I'll begin with you. Um, yeah, what, uh, 30 seconds, yeah, you, you've got one wish. If you are in charge of healthcare and money is no object, what's the one change you would make in the healthcare delivery system today? All right, free health care for all, and everybody can go wherever they need to to have every, any procedure done at any given time. Um, you know, I, again, I'm just hoping that everybody could walk into if they in a facility if they were sick and get the treatment that they needed. Um, and again, make sure that they're taking care of their needs, that they're being treated, you know, um, responsibly, and that there wouldn't really be an issue of who's going to pay for what. Okay, thank you. Just keep it going down the line. Oh, if I had my wish, um, you know, and I don't know all the interest, intricacies of this system. I have to tell you, I'm just the employer. Um, but, you know, I think it has to be affordable. It can't be, you know, somehow we got to manage the costs. I mean, it's just managing the costs and, and making it affordable. Everybody in, nobody out. Okay. Actually, I would agree with what Bobby and Karen said. The perfect system, everybody would be in, everyone would be accountable, and the care that would be provided would be the care that is needed, not necessarily the care that is desirable. And I'm going to be a little egocentric here. I want the data and I want the time. I want enough scientific data for me to for allow me to make decisions, and I want the time to interact with patients so I could make those decisions at a joint uh, uh, situation. Really. But if I, the genie, could answer my own, it would be to get rid of our silos and start working together to do these things because until we work together, um, we are really very unlikely to accomplish those things. Yet I believe everyone that we could. So I want to thank them for being a great warm up pack because that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. And look forward to seeing you at 6 30. There's another program. Okay, so three days yeah. on Twitter at 325. As soon as this one's done, there's a 10 minute break. And then there's prenatal Twitter, and then at 6.30 will be the, um, the evening keynote. Is this a new meeting of fetal monitoring and teaching in utero <laughs> texting? <or? laughs> you better come and find out. It's going to be fun. Okay.